So instead, we're going to prorate taxes on personal property. So if we include the car in the sale, then we're going to share this year's personal property taxes. Uh, rent, we can prorate rent if there's a tenant in place. And we can also prorate HOA dues. When we go contract the closing in Unit 21, we're going to pick up a calculator and learn how to prorate. We're going to learn how to calculate what each party's responsibility is for these shared expenses, shared items. Condition of property and risk of loss. This one's interesting. If the property is not in the same or better condition as it was at closing on the date of this offer, reasonable wear and tear expected, buyer may terminate this contract by providing written notice to the seller. And this is another time that they will get their due diligence fee and their earnest money back. So let's say we're under contract and the house burns down or the tree falls on the house. The buyer's got some choices. They could choose to terminate, get their due diligence and their earnest money back and go about their way. If the property is not in condition as it was on this contract, buyer shall be, uh, and buyer does not elect to terminate, buyer shall be entitled to receive the proceeds in addition to the property the proceeds of the seller's insurance claim. Buyer's agents, you're under contract and the house burns down. The buyer's gonna look at you and say, what do I do? First thing we do is pull the contract out and we sit down with them and we read this paragraph. We show them that they have choices. You can terminate and get your fee and deposit back or you can go on and buy the property, not only get the property, but also get the seller's insurance claim policy to rebuild. Then your buyer's gonna look at you and say, well, what should I do? And at that point, that's when I say, let's get the attorney involved because this got, if it's out for this contract, it's out of my realm, it's out of my lane. Does that make sense? I gave them their options. They won't have more questions. Now we gotta get the attorney involved for them to lay out their options for them. What you and I need to understand is the house is damaged, the house is destroyed while we're under contract. The buyer has choices. Uh, risk of loss, this is just reminding us that the property still belongs to the seller. So if the house does burn down when we're under contract, it's the seller's responsibility. Listing agents, we need to make sure our seller knows that they've got to maintain homeowner's insurance. They got to keep their homeowner's insurance policy until that deed changes hands. I got a whole unit dedicated to homeowner's insurance. It's a short and sweet unit, uh, but we're going to get a little bit better understanding of insurance, seeing this risk of loss, making sure that the seller keeps the property insured during, during that uh, contract to closing process until that deed changes hands. We mentioned a delay in settlement. We have this paragraph coming. Our offer to purchase and contract has a built-in delay of seven days. Delays in settlement are that common. They happen that often that they just go ahead and build it into the contract. So this is the deal. If we are delayed, if we're not closing on the settlement date, there's a delaying party and a non-delaying party. Let's say, for example, that the delaying party is the buyer because we don't have loan approval yet. We're close, but we don't have loan approval yet. That would make the seller the non-delaying party. The seller, as the non-delaying party, has no choice but to sit still and be patient for seven days. If the seller terminates within those seven days, they're in breach. On day eight, the seller could choose to terminate. And now the buyer would be in breach. But we have to give the non-delaying party has to give that delaying party that seven days. Again, delays just happen. New construction, you can almost always bank on new construction being delayed. Um, loan approval. 
I mean, all sorts of things. The possibilities are endless. We've had a lot of delays the last few weeks with all the hurricanes. A lot of our loan processors, for example, may not be able to finish the loan, may not be able to get through. I mean, there's anything that could happen. So I always, I always tell my guys to have a plan B. I don't want anybody sleeping tonight in the moving truck because they thought they were going to be sleeping in their new home and something happened to cause a delay. So always have a plan B, let them know we're going to work really hard to make this happen on the settlement date, but all sorts of things can happen. I saw a story online not too long ago. Buyer, buyer's agent, listing agent went to settlement, closing attorney, seller never showed up. They waited and waited. The listing agent called, emailed every way they had to get a hold of them. Never could get in touch with the seller. After so long of wait, everybody just went on home and said, well, if you hear something, let me know. But without the seller, we can't close. Y'all know what happened to the seller? They got arrested that morning. <laughs> Evidently, they didn't make their phone call to their agent to let them know. What could cause a delay? Anything. So have your parties have a plan B, please. Questions on that, comments? Possession, this is important. Possession, including all means of access to the property, such as keys, uh, mailbox keys, codes, garage door openers, etc shall be delivered upon closing. The contract says that the buyer should not be given access. They should not be given possession until that deed has been recorded. It's not a done deal. It's not the buyer's home until that deed's recorded. Guys, every single one of us on this call probably has a story about a buyer that got possession got keys before that deed was recorded. My question to you is, what does the contract say? And I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb going forward. When you're looking at buyers and sellers, when you're advising buyers and sellers, you need to ask yourself, what does the contract say? If you give your buyer, if your buyer gets possession before the deed records, and they go to the home and hurt themselves, and it's not theirs yet, that's gonna be on the seller. So they need not have access, they need not have possession. As a buyer's agent, I'm often handed the key at settlement. And as a buyer's agent, I keep that key securely in my pocket until I get that email that says, we are on record. And the buyer looks at me, well, can't we just go over and start moving in? Nope, because it's not your home yet. We're so close, but it's not your home yet. What if the internet goes down and the attorney can't e-record today, right? What if the power goes out? Somebody hits a power pole. There's all sorts of things that can happen. We may find ourselves in a situation where we get to do a buyer possession before closing or seller possession after closing. These would be different circumstances, in which case I got a form for both of these. We're going to talk about the form. We won't look at the forms. We're not going to actually look at any um, addenda, but we are going to talk about them next week. So these will come back up. Possession could, al could also happen if it's already tenant occupied. If the tenant is buying the home that they've been living in, then obviously possession has already happened. So that would be another exception. Questions on that? Possession. Important.
So as we pointed out, scattered throughout the contract, when the need comes up to use an addenda, the contract lets us know. So now we're at this provision where it kind of gives us a nice little handy dandy checklist to make sure that all addenda for this transaction are included. Remember, we're adding to them and making them part of the offer to purchase and contract. So using this section to go through, let's see, it was built prior to 1978, so I know I need the lead-based paint. Uh, my buyers get an FHA loan, so I know I need the FHA VA financing addenda, et cetera. These are the addenda, not all of these, but some of these we're gonna talk about because uh, several of these are commonly used, which means you're gonna see them in many transactions that you do. So we're briefly gonna mention these. We'll talk about these next week, but just using it as a little, as a little checklist to make sure that we uh, have everything included that needs to be part of this offer. Earlier, we talked about an assignment. We said any goods contract has to spell out whether or not it can be assigned. So 2T says this contract may not be assigned without written consent of all parties. Technically, 2T can be assigned. All the terms stay the same. The only thing that changes is the name of one of the, one of the parties. We can assign it as long as we have written permission, written consent by all parties. Tax deferred exchange, we're actually gonna talk about, I got a very brief, unit 18 is our accounting unit. We gotta put an accountant's hat on for like 30 minutes. That's how long it takes us to get through it. But a tax deferred exchange is just a, um, it's, an, it's a program for investors from the IRS that might allow them to defer paying taxes. So if this is a property that qualifies for a tax deferred exchange, that just refers to that. Most of this page is, they call it boilerplate stuff, which means it's just like legal verbiage that you're gonna see in most contracts. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this last page because I don't think you guys are gonna get test questions on it, but I do want to point out just a few things. Uh, first off, talking about the parties, this contract shall be binding upon and shall in order to the benefit of the buyer and the seller and their respective heirs. When do heirs kick in? When the individual passes away. Death is only an out when you're negotiating the offer. Once you're under contract, if the buyer or seller pass away, their heirs are expected to carry through with the terms of the contract. Their intentions were pretty clear. Yes, we have a bona fide signed contract in our hand. If the heirs can't or won't, carry through with the terms and they will suffer the consequences of that breach. Um, let's see, other good stuff. It's all good stuff. Make sure I'm not forgetting anything here. Computation of days. When you're talking in, in contract, days, a day is a day is a day. So Sunday counts, Christmas counts, all the holidays count. So if we were to do, for example, a due diligence period of 15 days, every day would count. A day is a day is a day. When you're counting days in contract world, day one is always the day after receipt or the effective date. So if our due diligence period we put in a number of 15 days and that went into effect today, tomorrow would be day one. And we would go to our calendar and we would say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and we would count out 15 days. But it's always the day after, um, the day after uh, formation effective date. Also mentioned here, dates or times mentioned in this contract are gonna be Eastern Standard Time because the property is located in North Carolina. There was a case a couple of years ago where a guy signed in California and we were already past due diligence, but in California, he wasn't. And so it turned into a thing and we went to court and the courts ruled 
wherever the property is located is the date and time that we're going to go for. We get into remedies, specifically about breach by the buyer, breach by the seller. I'm actually going to hold off on this until next week because it gets back into due diligence and earnest money. So I think that would be a good refresher from us for us for on Tuesday. So we're going to come back and revisit this. I don't plan on finish this today. Anyway, we're close. What are we on? 13 of 17. Y'all, this thing is 17 pages now. That's a whole lot for the buyer to buy and the seller to sell, right? So we'll come back. We'll hit up remedies next week. Um, okay, so this offer shall become a binding contract on the effective date. And then we have the place for the buyer and the seller to sign. Buyer on the left, seller on the right. Um, the effective date then is the date that I have both parties' signature. And then that communication of acceptance, the communication of the fact that it has been signed has crossed that line. And again, we'll review that next week as well. We still got more to say, more to do in unit 10. So we'll definitely finish that up. As we said with our agency agreements, if you have more than two buyers or more than two sellers, then we'll use the additional signatures addendum. We need everybody that's got to show up on closing day to sign the sales contract. If you have an entity buyer, an entity seller, their information goes here. Technically speaking, the contract ends on page 14 where the parties sign. The rest of the con the rest of the document, the rest of the form is kind of supplemental information to help us know how to proceed. So the signature, the party signatures is the official end of the sales agreement. We have our wire fraud warning again to the buyers and the sellers, help protecting their monies coming or going to the attorney's office via wire transfer. Earlier, we talked about our notice information. How do we want to be communicated? Do we have a place to put our buyers and sellers contact information if we want them to be communicated? And then we have the only place on this document that you and I belong. And remember, this is after the contract. This is the rest of the information. So confirmation of agency and notice address. Buyers on the left, sellers on the right. So looking at the buyers first, we have the selling firm. And then we have to identify the firm's role. Are they acting as a buyer's agent, a seller subagent, or a dual agent, a firm license number, and then the individual selling agent. Who is the one working with the buyer? Check this box if you are acting as a designated dual agency. So commission rule says that we have to identify our status in this transaction. And the sales contract gives us the opportunity, gives us the provision to put our information in there so we can identify our role and we can also identify how we want to be communicated with. Do you want me to email me, phone, et cetera? And then we go through that same little exercise on the right with the listing firm, what their role is, what's the firm's role. They acting as the seller's agent or the dual agent with the firm license number Individual listing agent acting as the designated dual agent. And then that agent's contact information. This is the only place that we belong on this document. The contract has already been formed. This is just that supplemental piece of it. The last page here is acknowledgement of receipts at monies. Once the contract has been formed, due diligence needs to be delivered from the buyer to the seller. Earnest money needs to be delivered to the escrow agent. Once you receive money, you need to sign acknowledging receipt. So the listing agent oftentimes will receive the due diligence fee on behalf of their seller. When the listing agent receives it, they need to sign acknowledging that receipt. Once the listing agent takes the due diligence fee to the seller, then they need to sign acknowledging receipt. And then we have the escrow agent 
acknowledge in receipt of the earnest money. May that be initial earnest money or additional earnest money. Can we all agree that on its way and in your hand is two different things? Y'all don't sign for it until it's in your hand. Because if you sign for it, you have a sign saying it's in my hand. Oftentimes it happens where the agent says, well, I'm going to stop it by, swing by after lunch. So just go ahead and leave me the form. I, I'm not signing it until I have it, until I have actually received it. If that due diligence goes missing, they're coming after you because you said you have it. Does that make sense? So don't sign for it till you have it. The other thing with the additional earnest money we have, remember that was a time is of the essence. So we just don't want to know the date that it was delivered or received. We also need to know the time to make sure it's in that time is of the essence. When we start on Tuesday, don't go anywhere yet. I'm not done. But when we start on Tuesday, we're going to talk about this last provision, paragraph 23 here. Again, that'll be a good opportunity to kind of review what happens to the monies. Of course, I encourage you guys to look over this stuff over the weekend as well, review where we've been. But this will be a good opportunity for us to just to kind of you know, catch up, make sure we're all good. What questions do I have? What do you guys think about the contract, the 17 page contract? It's a lot, isn't it? It's a lot. That's why we're just easing in. Remember my teammate, 45 offers? Can you imagine how overwhelmed the seller was? I mean, you guys are a little overwhelmed right now, right? I get it. I still read this thing, get a little overwhelmed. It's a lot of information. Imagine the sellers. Imagine a seller that doesn't have an agent or has an agent that doesn't understand these provisions, hands you, I don't know, 45 offers times 17 pages. I hand you 765 pieces of paper and say, sort through this and figure out which one you want to accept. This is why sellers and buyers hire us, you guys, is so we can walk them through. We can help them understand what's in this contract, what's being made when they make the offer and when they uh, accept it. So next week, we are, we're doing so good. I'm so happy with our time. So don't forget next week, we're nine to two. Again, the good news is once we cover that remedies paragraph, we may, we're going to talk about forms, but I don't think we have to look at another form. So we've looked at the forms with listing agreement, buyer's agency agreement, and 2T. So I would kind of go through those, be familiar with those. And those are the only forms you have to worry about for now. Next week, we go until 2 again, 9 to 2 next week. We're going to finish Unit 10, uh, keep working our way, starting on page 304, talking about some of those commonly used addenda, and then finishing up Unit 10. Once we finish up Unit 10, then we need to go through, we're going to go through the process of applying for your license. So we're going to talk about that process. We're going to go through that. Some of you may be ready to start your application now. Some of you may want to wait until this class is over. Uh, there's no wrong way to do it. I just need to give you guys your options. So once we get through Unit 10, I consider that about halfway, give or take. So you guys can have the option then to start that process if you want. But we at least need to have a conversation about it. Also, we have a midterm coming up. The way I'm going to handle the midterm, I'm going to, on Tuesday, once we get through Unit 10, I'm going to provide you guys with a link to the midterm exam. And I'm going to keep that midterm open for you for a week. We're not going to do the midterm in class together. We don't have time. So instead, we're going to open it up. I'm going to have that midterm link live on Tuesday. 
and I'm going to leave it open for you until the following Monday. You can start knowing now that you have a midterm coming up. I suggest taking some time this weekend to review and get ready for it. I'm going to encourage you guys to treat the midterm as if it was the actual exam. Treat it like the real test. The midterm will cover units two through 10 and 20, the things that we have covered this far. So what a great opportunity for us to go back and review and refresh and get ready for it. Two through 10 and 20. Remember with the midterm, I'm not looking for pass or fail. I'm looking that you try. Failure to take the midterm means you will not be eligible for the end of class exam. Did everybody just hear me? Failure to take the midterm means that you will not be available for the end of class exam. So you'll have from Tuesday after class on the 15th through the end of the day on the 21st. Can you guys give me two hours in a week to do the midterm? Perfect, you have to. Uh, how many questions on the midterm? 50 some, maybe early 60s. Um, is it open book? Well, that's a good question. I'm not with you when you take the midterm. I can't stop you from opening your book. However, your final exam, your state exam is not. So if we're treating this like a real test, then no, it's not open book because your end of exams are not. I can't stop you though. So I'm encouraging you guys to treat this like a real test. Kind of, it's, I think of the midterm as a checkpoint, right? Like if you were to sit down and take your state exam today, how would you do? So it's up to you guys how seriously you take it. Uh, is it timed? Yeah, I think you get two hours, give or take. Your midterm will be delivered on a program called Class Marker. Class Marker is what we use for your exam for your end of class exam. So this will give you really good experience with using class marker. Prior to the midterm, I'm in the email from Lane that you guys use to access this class every single time. Here's your Zoom link. And right below your Zoom link is a tutorial on how class marker works. It shows you how you can navigate the system, how you can go from question to question. You can bookmark a question. So I encourage you to take the time to watch this class marker tutorial uh, before you take the midterm. So you have an idea of how it works and then you can see, get an idea for how our end of class exam is gonna be delivered. So it kind of serves two purposes, one a checkpoint and two to expose you guys to class marker. Do I have to do the midterm in one setting? Yes, you can't go back once that clock, again, we're treating this like a real test. So just like our end of class exam, I, I'd appreciate it if you guys went into that with that mindset. I think that would be best for you guys. Again, I'm not looking for pass and fail. So if you guys, you know, you just go blow through it in 20 minutes and you get credit for it. I need help understanding how that's preparing you for the end of class exam. So I encourage you to take it seriously, encourage you to take it like a real test. I just need to see your score, pass or fail, to give you credit so you're eligible for that end of class exam. Questions on the midterm. And we'll go through all that again next week as that link becomes live. I'm going to make it live at 2 p.m. on Tuesday. I don't want anybody sitting through class trying to do it. Because I would call that a distraction. two through 10 and 20. Use this time to get yourselves caught up. Give it a shot. See how you're gonna do. Use it as a checkpoint. What questions do I have? Y'all have a good weekend. Study hard. Go have fun.
you know all that stuff. Go to parades. Let me know how Parade of Homes goes. Y'all have a good weekend, and we'll see you Tuesday. Thank you.